Welcome back to another edition of the Educational AD Podcast. We couldn't do this without the incredible support of our sponsors, and we want to start by saying thank you to all of them. First, thanks to our diamond sponsor, Varsity Brands, including BSN, Varsity Spirit, and Herf Jones. Varsity Brands, elevating student experiences in sport, spirit, and achievement. We also want to thank our platinum sponsors, Ephesus Lighting, innovating a brighter future at every level. Gilman Gear, always a step ahead. Camp Mobile, where teams communicate better. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing. And Vital Signs, bring student achievements to life. Thanks to all of our great sponsors. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. Our guest today is Mike Colby. Uh, Mike's a certified master athletic administrator, and he's a longtime AD in the state of Florida. He's also been inducted into um, two halls of fame, the uh, Florida High School Athletic Association and the Florida Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association Hall of Fame. He's currently uh, retired, but he's still very active in our organization. He's a member of our board of directors here in Florida, in charge of uh, our conference registration and vendors, and he's still very active at the national level. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Well, um, as you know, uh, from your many years as an AD, uh, the life of an athletic director is very busy, so we're going to jump right into it. We always like to let our listeners get to know our guests. So, Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born, where you grew up, where you went to school, and, and maybe how that love of sport uh, led to your first teaching and coaching job. Okay. Yeah, I was actually born nearly 70 years ago in Garden City, Kansas. Uh, didn't live there very long. I'm the oldest of three children. Uh, father was a glazer. Uh, mother was a typical housewife. Uh, grew up in the Denver metropolitan area. Went to elementary, junior, and senior high school in the Denver metropolitan area. Uh, graduated from high school in 1969 from Arvada West Senior High School, and then did my undergraduate work at Colorado State University, graduating there in 1973. I went on to get a master's degree from Florida International University uh, in 1978, and an uh, educational specialist degree from Barry University in Miami uh, in 1986. Uh, as you indicated, I'm, I've been retired now for two years, uh, actually retired twice. Uh, retired in 2008 from the Miami-Dade public school system after a 35-year career uh, as a teacher at the same school for all 35 years. Uh, then went on to uh, work with the Florida High School Athletic Association uh, in Gainesville, uh, spent 10 years with them, uh, retiring in 2018, and so now I'm uh, living a life of leisure. Uh, as I may have indicated before, I'm currently working with the uh, elections de department here in Alachua County, uh, with their vote by mail division. Uh, in fact, for this primary election we just had, we uh, processed over 35,000 vote by mail ballots. So that was over 50% of the actual ballots that were cast for that election. So we're expecting a much bigger response come November the 3rd. So that's a little bit about uh, where I came from, et cetera. Um, as far as my youth experience in, in athletics, I played uh, youth baseball and youth basketball until I blew up my knee in a PE class in the eighth grade. Uh, at that, from that point on, I, I had actually had three surgeries on that, that knee before I graduated from high school. So that kind of into any kind of athletic career as far as uh, any kind of contact sport. So uh, that was it for athletics. I, I did take up bowling as a, as a method of getting some energy out. Uh, ended up being one of the top 48 bowlers in the Denver metropolitan area during my senior year. Actually went to a uh, uh, Colorado State University on an academic scholarship from, from the Bowling Association. And that helped pay for that, that first, year, first year of college. So that wasn't bad. Uh, strangely enough, as far as athletics at the high school level, um, my PE coach in the eighth grade saw something in me. I don't know what it was, but he was also the football coach. And he came to me one, one day and asked if I'd be interested in, in doing the student trainer program, uh, the Kramer student trainer program, which was a correspondence course that I did over the summer. And so I became a student trainer for the uh, ninth and 10th grade years. 
taping lots of ankles, lots of wrists, etc. cetera. Uh, and that kind of got me involved with athletics at the, at the high school level. And then, of course, as I indicated before, the surgeries with the knee kind of preempted all that because every summer from then on, I was having a surgery on my, my knee. So that kind of took away any kind of opportunities to continue the, that student trainer program. Uh, as far as getting involved at the high school level, when I came to uh, Florida to, to be a teacher, there was never athletics coaching or any of that kind of stuff in my forecast. In fact, I actually got involved with the activities program before I got involved with the athletics program. The activities director came to me as a new teacher to the, to the school and asked if I'd like to get involved with uh, something with the sport or with the uh, clubs and that kind of thing. So she had me be the class sponsor for the class of 77. So I went through four years with those young people and, t and saw them graduate. It was a very interesting experience. Got involved with Key Club. Also got involved with the National Honor Society. Uh, then we had a change in athletic directors and the athletic director at that time came to me and said, would you be interested in coaching bowling? Because he, he knew that I'd had some bowling experience. So I said, sure. So I started coaching bowling and then there became an opening for girls tennis. So I took on the uh, job as girls tennis coach. And then the following year was tennis coach for both boys and the girls. So I didn't, as far as coaching, I was coach for both the bowling team and the, and the tennis team for a number of years before uh, getting involved in the athletic administration part of it, where I spent eight years as the athletic business manager uh, under Gary Cray, who's a former FIAAA past president, and then became athletic director and spent 14 years uh, doing the athletic director job before moving here to Gainesville. So that's kind of what got me involved and where I'm at and that kind of situation. Wow, what a great story. I knew bits and pieces of that. <clears throat> your, uh, your high school training experience, boy, that took me back. You're just a, a couple years older than me, but I remember vividly back in high school, that Kramer student trainer program. We had a number of uh, students at our school that uh, did that. That's very cool. Um, Mike, you've had a long career, uh, obviously extremely successful. Uh, in our profession, we always talk about the importance of leadership and, and mentoring that next generation. Who were some of your mentors uh, growing up? Um, you know, teachers or coaches or maybe people that you worked with um, during your career? I guess as far as the athletic portion of it, uh, my mentors were Wayne Story, who's a FIAAA past president, Ron Balaz, who's also a uh, past president of FIAAA. Both of them were involved in the uh, uh, athletic administration portion in Miami-Dade County. Wayne Story was the GMAC executive director or the county AD. And of course, Ron Balaz was at that time was the athletic director at Miami Coral Park. And so we kind of grew together, the three of us over that period of time. And I always looked at those two gentlemen as far as uh, uh, things that dealt with uh, athletics and the administration of athletics at the high school level in that particular county. Um, Dorothy Brunson was another one of my mentors. I admired her from the time I got involved with the uh, administration part of athletics. And it had always been a dream to go up and work with Ms. Brunson. And that was a dream that came to fruition in 2008. So that was another one of my mentors that I looked up to and had a lot, a lot of respect for. You know, I think anybody uh, in Florida during, you know, let's say our time that had a chance to, uh, you know, speak to Dorothy over the phone or, or have Dorothy speak to us over the phone uh, right. would, would share that. Uh, yeah, what a great lady. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, Mike, you, um, uh, you, you had a, a tremendous career, you know, as an athletic director. Uh, you were the first Florida athletic director to earn the uh, CMA designation. I first met you. Uh, kind of across the table. I was an athletic director, recently arrived in Florida, uh, was at a small school, and we had occasion to, uh, you know, have to appeal something with FHSAA, and you were, you know, uh, a part of that committee at that time. Um, how do you see the relationship, uh, how has it changed between, say, FIAAA and FHSAA uh, over the years that, you know, when you were an AD, to your time with FHSAA to now more recently, you know, your time as a uh, continued time as a board member with FIAAA. Well, in, you know, in the early years, uh, FI, or FHSAA uh, was kind of like a, a taboo thing to talk about. They were the people that come down on you when you did something wrong and didn't support you much when you did something right. 
uh, that administration kind of changed when the legislature got involved back in, I think, 1993. And they changed the format of the board of directors at, the, at that time. Prior to that time, it was just 15 high school principals throughout the state. And there was no term limits or anything like that. So it was usually the same bunch year after year after year after year. Uh, the legislature got involved and then streamlined that process so that the board of directors now is made up of a very diverse group of people. There are term limits, so it does have, you know, a, a change in the rotation of things. In fact, this year, we have one of our FIAAA past presidents, who's the, actually the very first female president of the FHSA board of directors. So that's a, quite an accomplishment for FIAAA to have somebody like that as the president of, that, of our board. Uh, she's not the only FIAAA past president who's been, on, been a president of that organization. Andy Childs, who's the current executive director of FIAAA, was also uh, president of that particular board. So two terrific great people that uh, did a lot for uh, the FHSA. And from that point on, FHSA got to be more of a sounding board. They would listen to you. They'd take your advice. Sometimes they wouldn't agree with it, maybe not follow it, but at least where they listened. And they continued to, continue to do that. Uh, the appeals process was the revamped considerably. I can remember one time when I had to take a young man to, a, to an appeals committee before the change and it was just an outright no. You, you don't have an appeal. You're, you know, don't don't even try to bring it to us. And but after that, you could actually take a student who you had some feelings for that their eligibility was being questioned, and uh, they would listen to you. And sometimes it turned out to be favorable. I know I spent six years I was on the sectional appeals committee, and there were many times we had to turn a child down. And many times we rewarded a student for great things. So. Uh, it wasn't always a, a no process. And I think that's one of the accomplishments that the FHSA has done is, is made a little bit more of a sounding board uh, and they do listen. Uh, sometimes folks don't quite agree with what they're saying, but at least they're listening and they are making some, some advances in, help, in helping uh, athletics throughout the state. So. Oh, I would definitely agree. And again, my involvement has, has not been as long as yours. Uh, I came to Florida in 2000, uh, but really didn't get involved with FI AAA until uh, 2008, uh, and so I've kind of I've seen some of that change. But no, I would I would agree with you. I'd say it's it's a very good relationship now. Um, let's talk a little bit um, about the job of an athletic administrator. Now, again, you've been retired from being a school uh, AD for a couple of years, but you're certainly uh, you know you've got your finger on the pulse. Um, how have you seen the job? of the school-based athletic director change, um, you know, and we can go back to when you started as an AD, or, you know, maybe we can narrow it down to the last, you know, even just the last 10, 12 years. Uh, how's the job changed uh, from you know, that period of time? Well, I guess the streamlining of the eligibility process of uh, uh, getting students eligible to participate, and then uh, getting those students to be able to participate uh, at, in a particular sport uh, was just at the regular season level or at the, you know, state competition level. Um, that's changed over the years. I mean, I can remember back, way back when, uh, lots and lots of paperwork you had to do, and there were no computers and things of that nature. So it was different colored sheets of paper that you had to file with the, the FHSA office and it had to be by snail mail. So you can imagine what that was like, you know, sending a eligibility form. You had to get there so many days before, before those students could be eligible. Uh, now it's much more streamlined. It's, technology's taken over. So almost as soon as you put a student in, in a computer, that student's eligible to participate. So I think those changes as far as technology has driven a lot of athletics for athletic administrators uh, to make it a little bit easier to work with. Now, sometimes people question the technology part of it because it's rather complicated. Uh, but uh, I can remember way back when where there was ADs that wouldn't even look at a computer let alone try to get involved with it. And you would tell them, you know, you got to go to the computer to do this. And they would look at you like, not me. And then fortunately they would have either an assistant athletic director or a business manager or somebody like that, that was a little bit more technology oriented and they could assist that athletic administrator in getting that task done. So I think technology has made a great big deal as far as advancement and, and the things that athletic administrators do at this point. Uh, so I, I, th I think technology has been one of the biggest things that's uh, helped athletic administration. Oh, absolutely. The fact that we're having this conversation right now, 
Yeah, face to face right. over a computer. Um, let's talk a little bit about our state organization, the FIAAA. Uh, I, I would dare say that uh, you know there's no one that you know probably knows more about this organization uh, than you from your um, you know, joining as a as an athletic director, attending conferences. You know, now I think you're probably the the guru of our constitution, uh, longtime treasurer, and the workings of that. And now, as I mentioned, you know, you handle the conference registration and deal with all of our vendors and sponsors. Um, how have you seen FIAAA change uh, from when you first uh, got involved as a school athletic director? Yeah, I've been part of the FIAAA board for 27 years. Uh, I'm just a regular member of FIAAA for a couple of years before that. But I came on as a district director uh, and spent uh, three years at the district director level before I took over as treasurer and then spent 21 years as treasurer with the association. I guess the biggest change that's happened with FIAAA is many, many years ago it was, it was seen more as a social organization. You get together, have a few beers, kick back, talk about things. You really didn't accomplish much. Uh, committee structure, there was very, very little of it. Uh, but once we got into that kind of thing and, and, and realized that if we're going to be the, the, the spokespeople for athletic administration for the athletic directors of the state, we're going to have to get more involved with different aspects of, of uh, athletic administration. And I think the advent of uh, the leadership training program, certification, things of that nature has helped move that along because it, way back then there, there was just not many people that uh, or getting involved with it. I can remember when I took over as a state leadership coordinator in 2000, there were 32 CAAs in the state at that point. Uh, there were no CMAAs. In fact, at that point, CMA wasn't even uh, thought of. Uh, so when I took over in 2000, uh, we had a lot of work to do. And I know we taught our first one single class in May of 2001. Uh, I think we had 14 people take it. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Andy Childs is one of the persons who took that course that year. Uh, but uh, two other past presidents that helped me with that course, and we got through that one. Following that, we had a couple of years where we just could not get people involved. And that was just because the precursor wasn't just, you know, athletic uh, administration didn't need all this leadership training uh, courses and things of that nature. So people just didn't see the value in it. And so it took some time to, to kick off. And uh, you look at our, our offerings now and the number of people that are taking courses at the state level, it's just leaps and bounds over what it was those many, many years ago. So I think the leadership training program uh, helped move athletics along. Our board got involved with it. Uh, many of our past presidents are either a CAA or a CMAA. Uh, so they've seen the value in it. And so a lot of our membership, uh, as far as the direct board of directors, have taken many of those courses and, and are moving towards certification. I think uh, our board has now determined that in order to be on our board of directors, you have to be at least a CAA. So many of them are, are doing that process, they're, they're getting involved. And of course, as you being a certification guru with, with the national, you'd like to see those people go on to CMAAs as, as well. So I think that's, that's helped uh, um, bring our board to a little bit more a viable board. Uh, the committee structure is really strong now. So we have committees that cover just about every possible thing that an athletic administrator could need to be involved with. And we're out there to help folks. And uh, I think that's turned FIAAA around from being a social to a professional organization. You know, obviously you were, you know, part of that uh, forefront, uh, you know, back during that change. Who are some of the other um, Florida ADs that, uh, you know, kind of helped uh, make that change and, and lead it to a uh, professional development organization? Well, it didn't take long for me just, you know, being the uh, treasurer of the association and being the, the leadership training coordinator that we started having conflicts. Uh, the state coordinators meeting would always fall on the weekend of a, of a board, board meeting. So there, there would have to be a decision made whether I'd go to the the board meeting as a treasurer or go to the state coordinators meeting and, and represent that group there. So we very quickly found somebody else to, to assist with that. And that was in the name of Andy Childs. And he was uh, a young athletic director, got involved with the leadership training program. And we saw that he has some value there. So he became the second uh, state coordinator. 
And so when those coordinator meetings would conflict with each other, he would go to the state coordinator's meeting and I would go to the board of directors meeting. We soon were able to make the contracts with uh, the hotels for our September board meetings so that we could both go to the coordinator's meeting and both be at the, the, the treasurer's meeting. So that's been the case ever since then. We then also brought on Lannis Robinson, who uh, is very uh, eager at that point was eager to get involved with uh, athletic administration. Uh, and he's done very well. As you know, he's president of the uh, NIAAA uh, board this year. And Charles was also uh, president of that board. So both those individuals came up through the uh, leadership training program and were very successful. Uh, those aren't the only administrators that have helped us teach. You yourself have helped, helped teach those courses. Uh, a number of past presidents as they went through through the ranks, they were uh, faculty members of uh, many of our courses. In fact, I relied heavily on some of those people in those early years to uh, get involved and, and, and teach those courses. As you know, before you can teach a course, you got to take the course. And so we had to get those people either to a state conference or to a national conference to take those courses and then solicit them to teach those courses. And we've been very, very successful in that. And in fact, the majority of our past presidents have taught numerous uh, courses over the years, and uh, it's been very valuable to them, very valuable to us. It's, uh, it's been great to watch it grow. I, again, I kind of came in uh, as that professional development component, I think, was just getting into high gear, and it's been fun to, to be around for that ride for the last 12 and, and maybe help it just a little bit. Let's go and talk uh, about COVID. Um, certainly it's impacted um, high school athletics, you know, across the country and of course here in Florida. And I'm gonna kind of put, try to put you on the spot here just a little bit. You know, you're not a, a school-based AD, you know, you're no longer, uh, you know, on the, um, uh, working for the FHSAA. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, and again, uh, full disclosure, we're recording this uh, on August 31st. So when this airs, you know, things might have changed a little bit. What are your thoughts about how um, this fall season has unfolded or is starting to unfold? Uh, we've seen a, a wide variety of responses across the country. Uh, you know, we, we know where we're at right now today in Florida. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, what do you think of, you know, the, the current uh, state of um, FHSAA and, and fall sports regarding COVID? Well, I, I know their board of directors had uh, some lengthy meetings over the summer concerning that, that exact situation and, and finally came to an agreement that they would start uh, the fall season. I guess last Monday was the official day for uh, most of the state to start. I think there were some uh, ways that you could start earlier if you petitioned the, the FHSA, and I know a number of schools may have done that. Uh, but primarily throughout the state, you had you could begin last uh, Monday, and so many did. Uh, and you, you hear here and there little outbreaks, you know, a number of students coming up, testing positive, etc. And I think that's the thing we're going to have to get used to. Until we get involved and get students in schools and, and athletes on uh, practice fields and courts and see how this thing is going to impact them, uh, we're not going to know how it's going to, what, what it's going to do. Uh, it may be nothing. It may be a lot. We don't know. Uh, I know here in Alachua County, today was the first day of school. Uh, I know a number of football teams did start practicing last week and, you know, they had information in the paper. Nobody here in Alachua County had said that they had any positive cases. Uh, so today's the first day that students will be back in the classroom and we'll see how that, that hand ends up. Uh, University of Florida also starts here this, this today. Uh, so here in Alachua County, we're getting, we may see, see some big impacts very quickly or maybe nothing at all. Uh, so again, until those students get out there and start mingling, and well, we know how it's going to impact things. Um, I know I, I spoke with a, a parent here in Alachua County who is a former student of mine and uh, was quizzing him on what he was going to do as far as his, his students getting back involved. He has a son that's a lacrosse player and is actually playing for Oak Hall. And he, he has gone face to face with, with, with classrooms. He's in person uh, courses, et cetera. He's, they started maybe two weeks ago as far as Oak Hall as uh, going to classes. His daughter is a junior at uh, Gainesville High School and, and she's gonna do it online. So here's a parent that's got two students doing it different ways, different schools, of course. 
uh, young lady is, is not an athlete. She does participate in some athletics, but she's not one of those stellar athletes, uh, but she's a very bright young lady and aspires to some great things. And so she was concerned about uh, the face-to-face -face aspects of it as being an older student in, in a bigger school, uh, as opposed to her brother, who's going to be at Oak Hall, which is a much smaller school. So I've seen both as far as parent having considerations uh, concerning it. Um, but again, until the students get back in class and athletes get on the field, we're not going to know how this thing's going to impact things. And I'm kind of the mindset that let them try, let them get out there because I think they, that social interaction is very important. And I think they need to get out there and, and get involved. So that's kind of where I feel. Uh, I, I appreciate you sharing. Uh, and, and again, I agree. Uh, I can state, you know, for our school, you know, up in the panhandle, um, you know, we had a very active summer, you know, sports camps, little kid camps and everything, and, and didn't have a single, uh, uh, you know, infection, uh, you know, positive uh, test. Uh, we've started school, we're actually into week three. Uh, most of our families are, are choosing, you know, the on-campus uh, experience, although we do offer it, you know, virtually. Uh, we've got phase two protocols, uh, masks and social distancing and entrance points and exit points. Uh, last week, you know, we had a couple of our football players test positive. So um, we quarantined the team. They started uh, all taking their classes at home. Practice was suspended. But again, you know, we, we're trying to get them out there. Um, you know, some states, you know, Utah, right. Arkansas, they're playing games already. So it's, uh, it's just interesting to see the, the variety of responses. Um, let's uh, backtrack a little bit. Uh, this is kind of a two-parter. Um, we always ask our EDs, you know, what's your favorite part of the job? So uh, yours is twofold. What was your favorite part of just being an athletic director? Uh, and then what was your favorite part about your uh, career with the FHSAA? You know, what'd you enjoy? What got you excited about getting up and going to work for both of those jobs? Well, as an athletic director, I guess the interaction with the student athletes was, was always something I, I look forward to. Uh, my philosophy was, you know, the coach is coach. Uh, and let them coach till there's an issue. Uh, but I let them do whatever they felt was necessary for, for, their, for their teams. And I was there to, to assist. And you know, I was always enjoyed going to contests. And I know I had many parents and student athletes that would thank me for always being there at their contest. I was the type of AD that would be at every home contest. Uh, try to get to as many away contests as possible. But if you're at home, uh, there's always somebody away. And so you can't be at both places at the same time. So I was always at the home events because that's where the parents would see me the most. And so they were always very thankful that I was there. I enjoyed interacting with the athletes, uh, assisting them with whatever they needed, uh, you're counseling them as far as their career and in going into college and et cetera. Uh, so that was something that was very important to me and very enjoyable was to, to meet with those student athletes and, and talk with them and, and interact with them. Uh, as far as the job with the FHSAA, again, Dorothy Brunson was somebody I looked up to. Uh, she was in charge of the eligibility uh, aspects of the association at that time. Uh, eligibility was an important factor with me. I wanted to make, make sure that my students were eligible and did everything to make sure that they were eligible. And so when I went to the FHSA, it was with th that goal in mind was to uh, work in the eligibility department with the association. And that's exactly what I did for the 10 years I was there. Uh, Unfortunately, being in that part aspect of, the, of eligibility, uh, I was considered a heartbreaker because there were times when I would have to tell a student, I'm sorry, no, you're, you're just not eligible. You don't have the GPA that's necessary. You're too old. You know, things that were, you know, in our bylaws that we had to enforce. And, you know, you tug at your heartstring, but uh, yeah, you had to tell some students, I'm sorry, you, you're, you're not eligible. And then there's always the other round where you would work with the school and the student athlete uh, to get them eligible, uh, to look at ways of raising their GPA, making them you know, take a summer course and asking those questions. Did, did a forgiveness grade get put into the transcript? And, you know, all kinds of little things that uh, sometimes an athletic administrator wouldn't think of. They would just see the report that came from a counselor that said the student was below a 2.0, and that was it. They wouldn't even, you know, look to see if there's any way you might be able to assist that student in looking for grade forgiveness and things of that nature. Uh, one of the other things I got involved with was the international students 
And we've seen that grow in leaps and bounds, et, et cetera. Because I can remember when I first started going up there, we had probably less than a thousand of those students uh, dealing, you know, in athletics throughout the state. And that's just, it's exploded. Uh, just, you know, the different ways a, a student can come to this country to study and get involved are amazing, whether it's uh, through particular visa types or moving here, et cetera. So we'd always try to find a way to get those students eligible uh, to participate, even though their visa classification may not be the type that would actually allow it. But we would find ways if it was just sub varsity level, you know, freshman level, you know, just something to get them on the field, let them play. Uh, so it didn't impact the state series because that's where the, the big impact came with those particular students because we had to watch those rules. And that's changed over the years as well, too. So getting involved with eligibility at the FHSA was an important part of what I did there. Well, and like I said, I remember uh, being on the other side of the desk. And again, you're very professional, uh, um, you know, appreciated uh, the way you dealt with a young uh, Florida AD at the time. Well, Mike, this has just flown by. I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, visiting with you, um, but we're not done. Okay. We always like to wrap up with what we call the athletic director's toolbox. Uh, you are certainly uh, an experienced AD, a Hall of Fame AD. And now I'm going to task you with sending out a brand new athletic director on their very first job. But I'm only going to let you put three items in their toolbox. What three things are going to go in Mike Colby's athletic director toolbox? Well, I guess the big thing would be communication, uh, communicating with their coaches, with their student athletes, uh, getting involved with a, a mentor AD uh, who they can call on a daily basis and say, what should I be doing today? Uh, I know I did that for a number of years with new ADs that came aboard down in Miami-Dade County. We had a one-on-one -on -one situation where our executive director down there at that time would team us up. And so I had a number of ADs that came on board as first-time ADs who I was their mentor to get them through that first year. And we would have daily conversations of what they should be doing that particular day as far as their tasks. So I think communication, um, is, is a key thing. Uh, getting involved with the leadership training program. Uh, the number of courses that are available out there to, to athletic administrators is tremendous. And all it can do is help uh, the, the situation that, that administrator may uh, encounter in their, in their building. Uh, whether it's a legal aspect or it's uh, getting a field ready for a contest or uh, making sure that fans are coming to their events. Uh, those are all types of things that uh, they can Get information from by going through the leadership training program and possibly certification. That would be the ultimate goal, becoming certified and showing their professionalism with being an athletic director. Uh, and then finally, just getting involved. So those would be my three items in the, in the toolbox. Okay, yeah, the last thing I'd put in the toolbox would be getting involved at the state and national levels with, with either the Athletic Directors Association or the uh, athletic, State Athletic Association. So there's two groups in both states that they can get involved with, whether it be at the administrative level, such as the FIAAA, or at the athletic level with the FHSAA. There's different things that they can do in both those uh, organizations as far as leadership positions, et cetera, that could advance their, their goals as an athletic administrator. Oh, absolutely. I would second that. You know, uh, I can't tell you, uh, you know, you certainly know, I can't tell you how much both organizations have helped me uh, in my time in Florida. Well, Mike, thanks again uh, for being a guest on the uh, podcast. Uh, as I said, really enjoyed it and, and best of luck with uh, everything you're doing uh, in your uh, so-called retirement. Right. Well, to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Uh, remember, uh, Anchor Podcasts is our host. Uh, these are also being uploaded uh, gradually onto the FIAAA website and to YouTube. So thanks for listening. Uh, we'll look forward to the next one.